Lesson 8, Baptism. Last time we continued our study of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. We've seen how the Bible describes our natural spiritual condition, and the picture of that natural spiritual condition is not real pretty. The Bible tells us that we are by nature spiritually dead, blind, and enemies of God. This helps us to appreciate the miracle that takes place whenever the Holy Spirit brings a person to faith in Jesus. In order to accomplish that amazing work of faith, the Holy Spirit uses what we call the means of grace. The means of grace are the means or tools that the Holy Spirit uses to convey to us God's grace in Christ. With his life and death, Christ has won for all people forgiveness of sins, freedom from the guilt of sin, and he has won for us heaven. The Holy Spirit uses the means of grace, that is, the sacrament and God's word, to create that pipeline through which a person receives all that Jesus has won for us. Last time we focused on God's word, or the Bible, through which the Holy Spirit works to create faith and to strengthen faith. In this lesson, we're going to look at that other category of tools that the Holy Spirit uses to give a person the forgiveness of sins, freedom, and heaven, all things that Jesus has won for all people. Now, the word sacrament is like the word trinity. Remember, in our first lesson, we learned that the word trinity, or triune, is never explicitly found in the Bible. Rather, this is a word that is used to describe what we find taught in the Bible. The same is true for the word sacrament. The word sacrament is not found in the Bible. However, it describes something that we do find taught in the Bible. In order for something to be called a sacrament, it needs to fit these three qualifications. It needs to fit this definition. It must be a sacred act, that is, an action that has been designated or set apart for special use that is instituted by Jesus. Jesus told people to do it and to keep on doing this. It must be something that uses an earthly element, something tangible or visible, connected with God's word of promise. Through it, God promises forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. When we look at the Bible, we find two things, two actions that fit this definition of a sacrament. The two things that fit this definition of sacrament are baptism and the Lord's Supper. In this lesson, we'll be focusing on the sacrament of baptism. We're going to begin our study of baptism by looking at the word baptize and what does baptize mean? Mark 6, verse 4 are the words of Jesus describing the religious leaders of his day called the Pharisees. They not only attempted to follow God's commands in the Bible, but added nearly 1,000 extra laws. Unfortunately, many of the Pharisees thought that they were going to be saved or had gained a special status before God because they, quote-unquote, kept all these different laws. One of those additional laws was that of repeated washings. Look at Mark chapter 7. When they, the Pharisees, come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles, and couches. Did you notice what they washed? Cups, pitchers, kettles, and couches. Now, how would you wash these things? Some you would likely pour water onto maybe submerse them into a large tank. But if it was a larger item, you might use some water to wipe it off or sprinkle some water on it to clean it. Interestingly, the word used here for washing in all these different ways is the word baptize. This shows us that the word baptize can be used for many different methods of applying water, not just one single way. Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 26 also describes baptism. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, talking about Christians, and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Notice the word that is used here to describe the Holy Spirit in washing away sin and making Christians, the church, holy. The word is 
washing. Therefore, the word baptize simply means to apply water. To apply water in any manner, whether it's washing, pouring, sprinkling, immersion, submersion, the word baptize does not identify one specific way for applying water, but rather simply a means to apply water in any way. Now you think of the various ways in which we use water. It's one of the most common substances found on the face of the earth. So what is it that makes this use of water so special? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28. Words that we will be returning to often throughout this lesson. Jesus says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that this application of water called baptism is different than other uses of water because it accomplishes something amazing. This application of water makes people disciples of Jesus. It is an application of water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This water is applied at the command of the triune God. He is the one that promises to bring about the effects that we'll see baptism brings. When this water is applied, a person is brought into a relationship with that triune God through faith. With these words of our God, this application of water brings about a spiritual miracle. What blessings does the triune God promise to bring through this simple action of application of water in the name of the triune God? Look at the words of the Apostle Peter in Acts 2 verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter speaking to a large crowd of people to whom he announced that Jesus is the Son of God who lived, died, and rose from the dead to bring them salvation. However, Peter also had told them that they were the ones responsible for killing Jesus, the Son of God. When they realized whose death they had been responsible for and why he had died, they were cut to the heart, the Bible tells us. They asked Peter what they should do and Peter tells them in this verse to repent and be baptized, but notice what their baptism would bring about. The forgiveness of their sins. Baptism brings the forgiveness of sins. Combine that with Titus 3 verse 5. He, God, saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Notice what the washing of baptism brings about. Baptism brings about rebirth, that is, spiritual life. In 1 Peter 3, verse 21, the Apostle Peter begins by talking about the waters of the flood during the time of Noah. The Lord used the flood waters to cover the earth, bring judgment on the wicked and evil that he had found on the earth. However, the Lord told a man named Noah and his family to build an ark a large boat which would save them from the destruction. While well, we normally think of the flood waters as bringing destruction and destroying things, it also brought about salvation to Noah and his family as it lifted them in the ark high above the destruction underneath. Now look at 1 Peter 3 verse 21. And this water, the water of the flood, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as the water of the flood saved Noah and his family from physical destruction, so the waters of baptism save people. This washing of baptism does not remove dirt, rather it brings salvation. It turns us around, conversion, bringing about a pledge of a good conscience that now wants what God wants in love for our Savior. The last part of that verse makes it repeatedly clear. Baptism gives salvation. The Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthian Christians of the unity that they share through their Christian baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
Paul says, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. The same Holy Spirit is given through baptism by which we are brought into the body of believers in Christ Jesus and made members of God's family. What amazing blessings baptism brings about. How can such a simple action bring about such amazing results? Just to remember, who is doing all the work in baptism? It's God the Holy Spirit. Who needs these blessings that God promises to give through baptism? Romans 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This verse reminds us of the all-inclusive effects of sin. All people are sinful and need forgiveness and salvation. Jesus explains in John 3 verse 3 that all people are in need of a spiritual rebirth because all people are born spiritually dead. I tell you the truth, Jesus declared, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Therefore, the Bible makes it clear that all people are in need of the very blessings that God promises to give through the washing of baptism. If baptism offers the very thing that all people are by nature in need of, are there any restrictions that God places on baptism? Anybody that God would exclude from baptism? Now look again at Matthew 28, verse 19. Who needs baptism? Who is it for? Matthew 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants us to go and make disciples of all nations, and he tells us how. He tells us to go and baptize them, referring to all nations. If we place restrictions on who to baptize, then we must also apply the same to all nations, meaning that there may be some exceptions to who Jesus wants to be his disciples. But that's not the case at all. Baptism is for all nations. We read Acts 2, verse 38, which we read just before. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But remember that Peter was talking to a large crowd of people early on the morning of Pentecost when he spoke these words. The crowd was likely made up of adults who had left their homes to see where the loud sound of a strong wind blowing was coming from. They had left their homes and gone to the temple where they found the disciples and listened to Peter's sermon. And when they heard the blessings that God promised to give through baptism, they must have wondered about their children. But then Peter adds verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. What miraculous, splendid news. Peter says that the blessings are baptism are for you and for your children. Therefore, the Bible places no limitations on baptism. Baptism and the blessings that go with it are for all people without exception. Does all people include infants? Well, some people might take a look and listen to infants and wonder how such a, a little one could benefit from baptism. They can't talk or even feed themselves. How could they possibly believe? But look at what Jesus says in Matthew 18. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Did you notice what Jesus says about the little ones and what they are capable of doing? These little ones who believe in me. The word for little ones can refer to a young child, a toddler, even a baby that can't even walk. Jesus says that little children are able to believe. The passage from Luke chapter 18 is similar to the previous one. 
People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. However, the word for babies in this verse is used to describe babies who were still being nursed. They needed to be carried by their mothers, which shows just how little they were. And yet, what does Jesus say about those babies? Jesus says that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. In order to be a member of God's kingdom, faith is required. Therefore, these little children had faith. The Bible tells us that little children can believe by the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you're struggling to understand how a baby, an infant, who cannot even express his faith in Jesus can possibly have faith or believe, remember who is doing the work in baptism. Baptism does not focus on what the person who is being baptized is doing, as if to say, God, I am now dedicating myself to be one of your children. No, it is not the work of the person being baptized. Instead, baptism is what God is doing for those who receive baptism. Baptism is all the work of God the Holy Spirit. Through water and God's word, God the Holy Spirit promises blessings. God declares, you are my child. And baptism is God's promise to you. A promise that never changes and is constant throughout your entire life. So when people ask, why does your church baptize infants? We might respond, why wouldn't you baptize infants? Babies are included in all nations. Babies are born in sin and need forgiveness of their sins. Through baptism, God grants forgiveness of sins. And through the Spirit's working, babies can believe. When we wonder how it's possible for a baby to believe, just remember that whenever faith is created, whenever a person believes in Jesus, faith is always a miracle of the Holy Spirit, no matter what your age might be. As we think about using baptism, we also need to remember what we learned last time. Remember that the Holy Spirit uses the hearing of God's Word, the Bible, that the Holy Spirit can also use that to create and strengthen faith. If you are not yet baptized, that is how you came to believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit was working as you heard the message of the Bible, the message of the law which shows that we are sinful and need a Savior, and then the glorious message of the Gospel, which tells how Jesus rescued us from the punishment of our sins by his perfect life and innocent death. Keeping that in mind, that the Holy Spirit can work either through the word or baptism to create faith, look at Acts chapter 16. This is the Apostle Paul's answer to a man who wanted to know about salvation in Jesus and notice the sequence of events and the audience. They, the Apostles, replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. Notice the sequence of events and the audience. They spoke the word of the Lord to this man and his family. They would have explained who Jesus is and what he did for them. They would have explained baptism, what it is and what it does. After that is done, what did they do? They baptized the man and his family. We know and we trust God's word that the Holy Spirit works faith through God's word. And therefore, in order to assure proper use of baptism and to avoid possible misuse of baptism, we instruct adults first and then baptize. In the case of an adult baptism, their baptism is really a, a seal and promise of what the Holy Spirit already gave to them 
when he brought them to faith, working through the word. This is especially important to keep in mind when it comes to adults who may be Christians, but were not properly instructed concerning baptism. What about those who are unbaptized? Well, look at Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And notice what is absent in the second half of that verse. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. The first half of verse 16 says that belief and baptism go hand in hand. However, the second half of the verse 16 says that only unbelief condemns a person to hell, not being unbaptized. Therefore, only unbelief damns a person to hell. However, remember the first half of the verse, faith and belief go hand in hand. A person who is brought to believe in Jesus by the Holy Spirit's working through God's word will naturally want to receive the blessings of baptism as Jesus wants to give. But if a person has not been properly instructed concerning baptism or did not have the chance to be baptized, but still believes in Jesus for salvation, will go to heaven at the end of their life. Still a Christian who sees what God promises through baptism will naturally want to be baptized. While all the blessings of baptism become ours immediately at the time of our baptism, your baptism is something that also continues to bring ongoing blessings and power throughout your life. Look at what the Apostle Paul wrote concerning the ongoing blessings of baptism in Romans 6. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. These verses remind us that our baptism connects us to Christ. His death on the cross as payment for our sins becomes our death on the cross as payment for our sins through faith. When he, Jesus, rose from the dead, he no longer had anything more to do with sin. In the same way as baptized children of God, we no longer want anything to do with sin. Our baptism reminds us of who God has made us and what we want to do as his dearly loved children. We want to offer ourselves as instruments of doing what is right and pleasing to the glory of our Heavenly Father. Therefore, remember your baptism often because in it you will find motivation and a source of power for your Christian life. Who may perform a baptism? Again, we turn to Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We see that this command is given to all disciples of Jesus of every age and generation. Therefore, anyone can perform a baptism because Remember where the power of baptism comes from. The power comes from the Holy Spirit working through the word that is combined with the application of the water. Because this is the case, the person performing the baptism and the place of baptism does not matter. Pastor or priest, minister or whatever Christian denomination, as long as the baptism is in the name of the triune God, the baptism is valid and effective. Considering the blessings of baptism, some may wonder how many times a person should or can be baptized. Remember that baptism is God's promise to the person. And look at what the prophet Isaiah writes concerning the promises of God. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. A person only needs to be baptized once. A baptism in the name of the triune God is effective no matter the place, the person performing it, or the method, sprinkling of water, submersion, immersion, or pouring of water. If a person is unsure if they are baptized, we will normally baptize that person, making sure that the person 
is receiving the blessings that God promises through baptism. This passage also speaks to those who claim that a person can never fall away from faith once they are baptized. Well, the Lord's promise always remains. A baptized person can reject those blessings that God promises through baptism. They're rejected by unbelief. That's a warning to us. However, if a person comes back to faith later on in life, the Lord's promise is still valid, and through faith, that birth has once again been received what the Lord, that person has once again received what the Lord promised in their baptism. One question that nearly everyone asks is, what about babies who die without baptism? Consider the following points. Scripture does not provide a clear answer, and we dare not say less or more than the Bible says. God wisely withheld this information from us so that we might not neglect to baptize our infants as soon as possible. If God had said, eh, all babies are saved until the age of 3 or 7 or 13, how many parents would make use of baptism? Likely very few. The fact that God does not say such a thing compels Christian parents to have their children baptized as soon as possible. We trust what we do know from the Bible, God's love, his mercy, and his wisdom. He knows our intentions, and he also knows our limitations. Therefore, we make use of the means of grace he does make available to us. Now, the end of this lesson provides some commonly heard questions or objections concerning baptism. The first one is some people's attempt to get avoid infant baptism. Some people believe in what is called an age of accountability. Here is that be belief explained. Some people believe that children are not held accountable for their sins until a certain age. Therefore, children who die before a certain age automatically go to heaven. The Bible does not speak of an age of accountability in regards to salvation. The Bible does clearly state that all people, without making a differentiation in age, are born sinful and in need of salvation. You might also hear this objection to infant baptism. Why, if baptism was intended for infants also, is the baptism of only adults mentioned in the Bible? Here are some things to consider. Since the gospel was being brought to those who had not yet heard of Christ, no one, adults included, had been baptized. So naturally, these adults would then be baptized upon hearing the gospel message. And the Bible does tell us that several whole families were baptized. Whole families would have also included their children. Another objection to infant baptism is this one. The teaching of baptism was introduced into the church after the time of the apostles. The truth is, the early church fathers, Irenaeus, Origen, Tertullian, Hippolytus, all write about infant baptism in such a way as to show that it was a generally accepted practice, not an innovation to be guarded against. Infant baptism was never widely questioned until about the time of the Reformation, about the 16th century AD. Finally, another possibly common objection. You seem to view baptism as a sort of magical formula. You think that if your child gets baptized, he will automatically go to heaven no matter what he does after that. Now, some might hold to that notion, but that is not what the Bible teaches. That is an abuse of what the Bible teaches. Even if a person is baptized, they can still fall away from faith. Baptism is only the beginning. It needs to be followed by instruction in the word to keep that seed of faith planted at baptism strong and growing throughout life. Make sure to complete the homework assignment before going on to the next lesson. And appreciate the blessings that God gives in baptism. Next time, we're going to move on to the other sacrament, and that is the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion.